Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. Questions 1 to 4. You will hear a talk about a museum. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Welcome to the Museums UK audio series, a collection of downloadable audio files introducing the best of British museums. My name's Sam Cooper, and in this file I'll be introducing the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology in Oxford, with its fabulous collections of Eastern and Western art, antiquities, casts and coins. It's one of the oldest public museums in the world, and it's actually part of Oxford University, though it's free to go in whether you're a student or not. You'll find the main museum in Beaumont Street, near the centre of Oxford, close to both the railway station and the bus station. Opening hours for visitors are from 10 o'clock in the morning till 5 in the evening on Tuesdays to Saturdays, 12 to 5 on Sundays and 10 to 7 on Thursdays in the summer months. It usually closes for three days over Christmas, a couple of days at New Year and three days for the St Giles Fair in early September. You can take photos in the galleries, but only with handheld cameras and not using flash or lights, which can do serious harm to exhibits. Also, as long as you follow all the copyright regulations and you get permission from the staff on duty, you can ask for antiquities documents of less than 100 years in age to be photocopied at a cost of 5p per A4 sheet. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Perhaps not surprisingly, given its links with the university, the Ashmolean has an education service for schools and the general public. Activities include guided group visits, which for adults last 60 minutes and cost £4 each. This makes the minimum price per group £28, as group sizes vary from 7 to 15 people. Visits by groups of young people take the same amount of time as the adult tours, but cost just £2 for university students. So, with at least seven to a group, the lowest price is £14, though please note that there's an upper limit of 14 group members rather than the 15 for adults. For schools, there are visits to suit all age groups, and for the most popular ones, such as those to see the Greek and Egyptian collections, it's best to book a term in advance. Tours last 50 minutes, starting at 10.15, 11.30 and a quarter past one, with a maximum of 13 children per group. Now, if you're free in the middle of the day, why not go along to one of the 45-minute lunchtime talks? There's a really wide range of topics. On the 19th, for example, the subject is Greek mythology, and on the 20th, there's Celebration of India. Both begin at 1.15, the usual time for these talks, and they're held every Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday. Another regular feature, on Saturday mornings through to the afternoons, are the workshops. If you're interested in developing your own illustrative and artistic skills, these are for you. They're aimed at artists of varying levels of experience and are always led by practising artists. Running for six hours from 10 o'clock, 
This is wonderful value at just five pounds, including basic materials and also a decent cup of coffee. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man, Martin Hill, phoning an estate agent in order to find some accommodation. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello, Brindle's estate agents here. How may I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm ringing to see what flats you have for rent at the moment. Right. Can I start by just taking your name, Mr... Um... Hill. Martin Hill. Right. And are you looking for a flat for yourself or um, a family, perhaps? Well, it's for three of us, myself and two friends. We're going to share together. I see. Um, what about employment? Are you all students? Oh, no. We've all got full-time jobs. Two of us work in the central bank, that's Chris and me, and Phil, that's the other one, is working for Hallam Cars, you know, at the factory about two miles out of town. I'll put you down as young professionals, then. And I suppose you'll be looking for somewhere with three bedrooms? Yeah, at least three. But actually, we'd rather have a fourth room as well, if we can afford it, for friends staying over and stuff. Is that with a living room to share, plus kitchen and bathroom? Yeah, that sounds good. But we must have a bathroom with a shower. We don't mind about having a bath, but the shower's crucial. OK, I'll just key that in. And... Are you interested in any particular area? Well, the city centre would be good for me and Chris, so that's our first preference. But we'd consider anything in the west suburbs as well, really. Actually, for Phil, that'd be better, but <laughs> he knows he's outnumbered. <laughs> but we aren't interested in the north or the east of the city. OK. I'm just getting up all the flats on our books. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Just looking at this list here, I'm afraid there are only two that might interest you. Do you want the details? OK, let me just grab a pen and some paper. Fire away. This first one I'm looking at is in Bridge Street and very close to the bus station. It's not often that flats in that area come up for rent. This one's got three bedrooms, a bathroom and kitchen, of course, and a very big living room. That sounds a good size for you. Hmm. So what about the rent? How much is it a month? The good news is that it's only £450 a month. Rents in that area usually reach up to 650 a month. But the landlord obviously wants to get a tenant quickly. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a bargain. What about transport for Phil? Well, there'll be plenty of buses, 
so no problem for him to use public transport. Uh, but unfortunately there isn't a shower in the flat, and that location is likely to be noisy, of course. Uh, OK. What about the other place? Let's see. Oh, yes. Well, this one is in a really nice location, on Hills Avenue. I'm sure you know it. This looks like something a bit special. It's got four big bedrooms and, um, there's a big living room. And, oh, this will be good for you, a dining room. It sounds enormous, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds great. That whole area is being developed and the flat's very modern, which I'm sure you'll like. It's got good facilities, including your shower. And, of course, it's going to be quiet, especially compared with the other place. Better and better. But I'll bet it's expensive, especially if it's in that trendy area beside the park. Mm, I'm afraid so. They're asking £800 a month for it. Whoa! It sounds a lot more than we can afford. Well, maybe you could get somebody else to move in too. I'll tell you what. Give me your address and I can send you all the details and photos. And you can see whether these two are worth a visit. Thanks. That would be really helpful. My address is flat five. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an expert on birds talking about sparrows, one of the most common bird species in urban and suburban environments around the world. The expert discusses some possible causes for their declining numbers. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Some people dislike sparrows and see them as annoying pests in their neighbourhood. Others see them as an interesting part of the urban environment. Love them or hate them, it could be that the familiar scene of these birds flying, hopping and chirping in our city streets will soon become a thing of the past. Until recently, there were so many sparrows around that people tried all kinds of methods to get rid of them but it now seems that many people are starting to worry about the declining numbers of sparrows in many cities around the world. Over the past 20 or 30 years, sparrows have been disappearing throughout many parts of the world. In Britain, since the 1920s, the overall population of sparrows has declined by 92%. In London, they were once so plentiful that people who conducted regular surveys did not bother to count them because they were simply too common. Now there are none. This decline has also been recorded in some cities in continental Europe, parts of North America and India as well. Some people will be surprised at this as they probably still see many sparrows in their local neighbourhood. But whereas some suburbs may have large numbers of sparrows, in the next suburb there may be none. So, why are they disappearing rapidly in some areas, yet still exist in large numbers in others? Well, it is a bit of a mystery. Some say it is due to local issues. There are a number of factors here, one of which is harassment or predation. Other local animal species harass them and domestic cats hunt them for food. Secondly, there is increased competition both for food and for nesting sites from other seed-eating birds in the neighbourhood. And thirdly, it is now more difficult for sparrows to make nests in modern buildings due to more effective modern building methods. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Recent studies suggest that another reason may be related to a problem with the breeding success of the sparrows. Although they continue to breed, the young nestlings keep dying. These deaths have been linked to a lack of insects, such as aphids. This decrease in the availability of insects, it is believed, then causes the young nestlings to die of starvation or dehydration. It seems that there is a growing worldwide shortage of insects, and our modern urban lifestyle with the increasing use of motor vehicles is being blamed for it. It is suggested that the carcinogenic chemicals released into the atmosphere by unleaded car exhaust fumes is having an impact on insect numbers. Another theory, which is thought to be affecting sparrow numbers, is connected to our technological advancement. According to some experts, the mobile telephone towers that are now a feature of our modern cities emit electromagnetic radiation, which might affect the sparrow's central nervous systems and result in their death. The evidence is only circumstantial, and sparrows still continue to thrive in some major cities. However, it is interesting to note that in the 1990s, the use of mobile phones and unleaded petrol skyrocketed, and both coincide with the period of the sparrows' declining numbers in many modern cities. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about geotourism. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 34. Now, I'd like to move on to talk about something called geotourism. Geotourism is very basically leveraging the benefits of tourism for local communities. I would just like to give you a couple of statistics which are very illustrative of the current situation with regard to young travellers and international tourism. Firstly, tourism has an impact on more people worldwide than any other industry. Indeed, it has an impact on one in every two people, either directly or indirectly. The second statistic is that in global tourism, there is a 97% economic leakage. This means that if you spend £100 on going on holiday, normally only £3 of that money will actually reach the people who are giving you the services and the accommodation, for example, in the destination. If you put these two figures together, you can understand why some of the regions of the world which have very high levels of tourism still have very high levels of poverty and huge developmental challenges. These countries have this massive industry demanding a huge number of services, but they are not seeing a fair reward for these services. Geotourism is about changing this. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 35 to 40. Projects are now being developed with financial organisations such as the World Bank. One of these involves developing a technology platform which is bringing grassroots travel products such as hotels, locally owned hotels, not global chains, 
very locally owned tour operators to the international travel market, therefore avoiding the middlemen. These middlemen often cut them out of the market completely or just make their business unsustainable. Another way that geotourism can be promoted is through the niche travel market of volunteering. These days, a significant number of older teenagers want to spend a gap year, either between school and university or university and employment. Often, these people want to spend some or all of their year volunteering, but they either don't have the money or don't feel inclined to pay the main volunteering organisation businesses the fee they require, which can be as high as £3,500. What they are looking for is an organisation who can connect them with people on the ground, who can suggest worthwhile local projects. So, this is a real win-win scenario. The organisers charge a small flat fee, which then goes to the local contact. Thus, the local contact gets a very good commission just for one customer. The customer is also saving a large amount of money and time, both of which they can give to the projects they end up working on. There is still quite a long way to go before poverty in the most popular of tourist areas is eradicated, but a focus on this type of geotourism could provide an answer. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.